The best thing about having to go to my wife's office party was that I got a chance to drive my Challenger full open. The worst part was that the faster I drove, the quicker I would get there. The gathering was at the company lodge, and there was a nice 20-mile stretch of road leading up to it. No stop signs, no traffic lights, and no traffic. Just open road waiting for the Dodge to do her thing. That also meant no gas stations and no jiffy stores. Candy and I had been drifting apart ever since our daughters both got married. I was hoping for just the opposite, but it was not to be. Candy insisted that I accompany her to this function, even though I indicated that I did not want to go. Previously, she had gone by herself. Candy was a drinker, and I wasn't. I did have a beer occasionally. She was also a social butterfly, and I wasn't. For the last year, I suspected that she was having an affair. At this point, I didn't care. I guess that was part of the reason we were drifting apart. I was biding my time, just looking for a way out of an unpleasant relationship. I needed a way to end the affair. I have to admit that I am probably the reason that my wife decided to seek greener pastures. I am, so to speak, a weird type of minimalist. I grew up in a very poor family. My brothers and I had far less than most kids our age. By that, I mean things like bicycles, toys, pets, fancy electronic gadgets, and stuff like that. It was almost like being Amish without the religion. I wasn't stupid, and I fully understood the way the normal world functioned, but couldn't bring myself to go along with it. I knew that it was important to stay out of debt. It was important to pay your bills, and it would also be prudent to put something aside for retirement. To live a comfortable life as a minimalist, you do not have to be a fanatic, but you do have to keep yourself under control. By allowing yourself a few indulgences, you can appear to be normal to most people. My biggest indulgence was my marriage and family. It was really difficult for me to find a woman who I felt could tolerate my eccentricities and who could accept my uniqueness. Candy was from a similar background as I was and was used to living a frugal lifestyle. She didn't embrace it as I did, but she could tolerate it. The longer we were married, the more she seemed to normalize. What I mean is that she became less frugal and more average. I didn't like it, but I understood, especially after the girls were born. So that we would not appear to be weird, we bought a small practical house and started to wear better clothes. Candy was getting her hair done occasionally and became quite adept in grooming and makeup skills. We got two smartphones, last year's models. As the girls got older, Candy started to work. It was a minimum wage office job. Transportation was necessary, so we got her a small Honda Civic, just like I had. Her wages just about paid for the car expenses, lunches, and her new wardrobe requirements. It was a wash, but I was happy with that. My name is Michael Johnson. That is about as common a name as a man can get. I work as a parts puller for a local company that makes industrial compressors. The job is very repetitious, but I enjoy it. I was comfortable with both the position and the salary. At times, I was offered promotions but turned them down. I did not tell Candy. My second indulgence was one that I kept from my wife. I felt it would be prudent to save for our retirement. Every chance I got, I would buy a one-ounce Krugerrand. I had over 30 in my basement safe, and I was just starting. My final indulgence was a 1970 Dodge Challenger. My older brother, Travis, was killed working on an offshore oil platform. He left me the Challenger in his will. I was able to keep it up by myself, but the insurance premiums were a killer. Candy had done well working for Gilbert Industrial. She got regular raises and promotions. During the first year, she talked about her job quite a bit, but then it started to taper off. Now, she rarely mentions anything at all about work or the people she works with. I knew something was not right, but could not put my finger on it. I was hoping to get a better idea of what was going on tonight. The company gathering was sort of like a retreat. It was a weekend event. I felt out of place even having to go to it. I had met all of her associates at one time or another, and I did not like any of them. We left the interstate at Holbrook, and I was finally able to let the challenger lose. She responded just as I knew she would. Candy was not comfortable with the speed, but held her tongue. Yes, I did exceed the speed limit. No, I didn't care. Mike, what is the hurry? 
We have plenty of time to get there. Why don't you slow down a bit? I am not anxious to get there. You know damn well that I didn't want to go at all. I am just using this time to clean out the engine. She needs to run every once in a while. Please try not to be a spoil sport. This weekend is important to my career. Mrs. Griffin said it would be essential for you to be here also. Lois Griffin was the wife of the company president, Oscar Griffin. It was old money and an old business. Why? What do you mean? Why is it important for me to be at this company event? I don't understand. Mike, it is necessary that you completely understand my new position in the company so that you can give me the support and backing that I need to do my job. I still don't understand. I am sure that Mrs. Griffin will be able to explain it to you when we get there. I have always supported you in the past. Why is it different now? My new position has a lot of unique responsibilities. Lois said that you should be exposed to them gradually so that you can fully understand them. It might be difficult for you to comprehend at first, but she assured me that you will come around. By the time we got to the lodge, my adrenaline was pumping. It didn't take a genius to understand what Candy was trying to say. It was going to be an interesting weekend. When we arrived, Candy walked into the lodge, leaving me to bring in the bags. I felt like I was being put in my place. Hey, nice wheels, Mr. Johnson. What is it? A 70 or 71? It was Wally Bailey, the company officer boy slash gopher. Hi, Wally. How are you doing? It's a 70. Wally introduced me to his wife, Margaret. They were sitting out on the front porch, but it seemed as if everyone else was inside. I did a glance around the parking area and guessed there were about 16 cars and one beat-up old truck at the end of the lot. We spent the next five minutes talking about the Challenger. What are you doing outside? Why aren't you and Margaret inside with the people? It's not our type of crowd, Mr. Johnson. We were hoping to leave early, but Mrs. Griffin insists that we stay around. We came up early today to help get things set up. The caterers all left about an hour ago. You're going to have to explain yourself. What's going on? Something fishy, but I don't know exactly what. I don't want to get you upset, but I think it has something to do with your wife. Are you staying the full weekend? No, that's why I got my truck parked over by the side, so I don't have to worry about getting out later. Things were getting more interesting every minute. Well, I better get this stuff up to our room. Let me know before you leave, okay? Sure, Mr. Johnson. Be careful. Don't do anything stupid. Luckily, it was only two small carry-on bags. As I entered the lodge, Mrs. Griffin caught my eye, smiled, and waved. Candy was waiting at the top of the stairs for me, and looked a bit aggravated that it took me so long to get in. It's about time, Mike. We have a few hours to get ready for the evening. Get cleaned up and put on something presentable. It is going to be a special night, and I want everything to be perfect. If it's all right with you, I am going to take a stroll around the property for a bit to wind down. I'll be back in plenty of time. I noticed that I got a little smirk as I left the room. There was a slight chill, which made my stroll a bit more pleasant. As I estimated, there were indeed 16 cars. They were mostly Mercedes, with a few Jaguars and a Lexus thrown in. Four of the autos had out-of-state license plates. I was a bit confused trying to figure out how a woman in my wife's position would qualify to fit in with people of that caliber. She, or should I say, we were definitely out of our class. Something was not right. I noticed that Wally and Margaret were loading their bags in the truck. I waved and walked over to chat a bit. I see that Mrs. Griffin decided to let you leave. Not really. We are sort of sneaking out. I don't feel comfortable here, Mr. Johnson. Wally thought that maybe we should stay, but I talked him out of it. Margaret was quick to add, Could you do me a small favor and stick around until after the evening buffet? I am a bit worried also, and I would appreciate it. I have no idea what is going on, but I don't like it. Great minds think alike. Isn't that right, Margaret? She blushed a little at my meager, humorous attempt. I think we can. There were crab and oysters on that serving line. I think I was going to like Wally. I did dress up, as my wife insisted. Before we got to the buffet, our hostess took my arm and walked me to a quiet alcove. 
We are so pleased that you choose to come tonight to support Candy. This is a big step in her career, and it is important that she has your full support. The increase in salary and benefits is very substantial, and I am sure you will be happy with it. Excuse me for asking, but what is the position that we are talking about? Candy has been a bit evasive. When I question her about it, she usually just blows me off and tells me to wait until tonight. Nothing to worry about, Michael. I think she just wants to surprise you. You didn't answer my question. There is no official title. I guess you could just say that she is a personal assistant. I see. Well, the buffet looks good. Thanks for the explanation, Mrs. Griffin. Lois, please. Call me Lois. I spent the next hour or so sampling everything on the line. Candy was busy socializing with the important people, so Wally, Margaret, and I got to spend a little more time together. We were just wrapping things up when Mrs. Griffin came over. Michael, Candy said that you brought your sporty little car with you tonight. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind making a little booze run for us. I smiled and nodded my head. There are three cases of wine at the ABC store in Holbrook. They are already paid for, so all you have to do is drive down and pick them up. There shouldn't be any problems, but if there are, just call me. Make sure you take your phone with you. I'd be glad to Lois. I'll let Candy know and be on my way. As she walked away, I glanced over at Wally. Meet me outside in five minutes. Candy just smiled when I informed her that Mrs. Griffin had asked me to help. Her only comment was, don't forget your phone. Interesting that they both empathized the same thing. Wally, I need a favor. He smiled as I threw him the keys to the Challenger. You're serious? Drive it down to Holbrook and pick up the three cases of wine at the ABC store for Mrs. Griffin. I have a feeling that there might be a problem of some sort which will result in a delay, if you know what I mean. Wally smiled and nodded. Here's my phone. Just put it on the dash. If it rings, don't answer it. Whatever you do, don't turn it off. Any questions? How long do you want us to stay away? At least two hours and top off the gas before you start back to the lodge. Enjoy! It was a bit chilly outside, but at least I had the foresight to put on a comfortable jacket. Now, all I had to do was wait and watch. You could see most of the inside of the lodge from various places on the back porch. A thermos of coffee would have been nice, but I didn't plan that far ahead. I found a comfortable spot where I could see in and not be spotted. Candy appeared to be the center of attention. I still didn't know why, but I had a good idea. She was smiling, laughing, and mingling like a movie star. About twenty minutes later, Mrs. Griffin and Candy carefully looked at Candy's cell phone. I knew exactly what they were doing, checking my location. Well, thanks to Wally, I was now just about into Holbrook. They both smiled as Mrs. Griffin held up her hand and started to speak. Unfortunately, I could not make out what was being said, but everyone in the room seemed to be quietly approving what they heard. It almost seemed like low-level applause. Oscar Griffin walked over and took Candy's hand. They started up the main staircase and stopped. He raised his and her hands up in the air, similar to a victory salute, and they both laughed. I was able to hear the cheering in the room as they ascended the stairs. I still had about an hour and a half until the Challenger would be back. I decided to take my time and enjoy myself. I always had my trusty buck pocket knife with me. It was a gift from my daughters about ten years ago. It was good steel and held a sharp edge. I looked over my target area and figured that I would start with the cars closest to the lodge. I took my time. There was no rush. I carefully placed each valve stem in my jacket pocket. I didn't want to lose any, and I didn't want to litter the Griffin's driveway. Sixteen cars and sixty-four valve stems. I had almost an hour to go. What to do? What to do? Four of the cars were locked. The rest were all open, so I started at the closest one to the lodge again and removed the registration slips. Some were on the visors, but most of them were in the glove boxes. I had no idea what I was going to do with them, but thought that they might be nice to have in the future. I still had a thirty-minute wait until Wally got back. I decided that the valve stems on the spare tires had to go. Since I had access to the cars, I also had access to the trunks. Twenty minutes later, I had ten more valve stems, 
Two of the cars had no spare tires. I know it was petty and juvenile, but it gave me a bit of light satisfaction. I am not a big fan of confrontation, so anything that I did or intended to do would be low and sneaky. I had no self-image problems, so I did not feel the need to come across as manly or heroic. I'll let all of the alpha males assume that role. Twenty minutes later, the challenger returned. Wally and Margaret both seemed to have enjoyed the ride. He verified that there was indeed a delay at the ABC store, as I expected, and it looked like it was pre-planned. There were no calls to my cell phone while they were gone. I turned it off and took out the SIM card. They were anxious to get home. I thanked Wally, wished him a safe trip, and strongly recommended that he find another job as soon as possible. I am sure that the cases of wine in the truck were pretty expensive. It was an easy problem to solve. I just put all three cases on the front porch of the lodge. There was no way that I wanted them to accuse me of stealing anything. The trip home was relaxing. There wasn't too much at the house that was important to me. A few personal papers, my laptop, and my Krugerrands. Originally, I was going to torch the house before I left, but that would have made Candy a martyr. I didn't want to do that. I was on the road within two hours. I did not feel the necessity to leave the traditional note or wedding ring. Let her figure it out. I was in no rush and had no destination in mind. I drove for two days. It was Monday morning when I called into work and gave notice. I requested that my final check be sent to my parents' house in Carlisle. They were not happy that I quit without given notice. I apologized, but did not offer an explanation. You can always count on a good breakfast at Waffle House. I picked up a local merchandiser paper on the way in and found an interesting help wanted ad for a local supermarket. They were looking for a person to stock shelves between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. After breakfast, I checked out the market. It was in an eclectic older section of Chattanooga. I spent the next hour driving around the neighborhood. There were a lot of older craftsman cottages and a few mobile homes in the immediate area. I could be happy in a small trailer, but was hoping for a step up. Then, I happened to stumble across a sign offering a garage apartment for rent. I hadn't inquired about the market job yet, but didn't want to lose out on the garage apartment. The garage was not included, but when I offered $50 a month more rent, they went for it. It was a small one-bedroom unit with only a half bath. It was sort of furnished. Bed, dresser, table, and chairs. The rent was right, and the location was right, so I took it. I'll solve the bath problem later. At least I had a home for the challenger. The supermarket situation was a bit different. They had plenty of applicants, but not too many that they felt comfortable leaving alone at night in the store. I explained my situation to the owner and didn't mince any words. What clinched the job for me was when I offered to work under the table, with no benefits, and at a dollar less than they wanted to pay. They never even asked for my social security number. I was happy, and they were happy. It was a ten-minute walk from the apartment. I spent the rest of the day getting settled in my new home. The landlord gave me the access code to his internet, which I thought was nice. After a quick trip to the local Goodwill, I had some kitchen stuff and a small microwave. I also got some linens and cleaning supplies. That night, I canceled my life insurance policies. I decided not to mess with the banking or credit cards. What can she hurt? Both of our daughters were now married. That made my leaving a bit easier. No grandchildren yet, but I am sure it wouldn't be too much longer. I called my daughter Batty and let her know that I was okay. I asked her to be available to help her mother if necessary. Batty was aware that I had left, but Candy had given her no other information. She promised to update her sister Alice. I deleted all the calls from my wife and turned it off again. I needed a shower. Maybe tomorrow. Not everything was perfect. I had to find a secure place for my gold. I realized that what I had was not considered to be significant, but to me it was important. For some strange reason, I ended up getting a safety deposit box in Huntsville, Alabama. I was hoping that they couldn't connect it to me in Chattanooga. Of course, I was completely wrong, but I felt that I had at least tried. It was almost a two-hour drive, but I didn't mind. 
The garage door at the apartment was fairly secure, but I installed a new hasp and a heavy-duty lock just to make sure. I had to protect my baby. It did not take long to get settled in at my new job. The first three nights they had a man work with me, and then they left me on my own. I didn't have to do anything in the produce or the meat department. The biggest pain was in the frozen food section. I had everything under control after the first two weeks. For $20 down and $10 a month, I got a Planet Fitness membership, which solved my shower problem. The big downside was that I had to give them a credit card number. I had to make another trip to Huntsville to get a credit card at my new bank. I was beginning to see how hard it was to get completely off the grid. Some modifications were going to be necessary. I had no idea how hard Candy would try to look for me, or if she would try at all. To hell with it. I'll deal with that problem when it comes. In no time, I had the routine down pat. I started work at 10 p.m. and finished at 6. It was a 20-minute jog or 30-minute walk to Planet Fitness. I had originally joined primarily just for the shower facilities, but gradually started using the other gym equipment. By the end of the first month, I was getting almost two hours of gym exercise every day. I felt better, and I was also losing a little weight. I never considered myself to be heavy, but I was a bit flabby. It felt good to get back into a routine. I was comfortable with my new job and enjoyed it. It was repetitious, but it was also different. Hard to explain, but I am sure you can figure out what I mean. I did my job and they left me alone. The gym was also a good selection. In no time at all, I had decided what exercises I liked to do and which ones to avoid. I discovered that I got no pleasure or enjoyment working with heavy weights. Since I was running to my workout every day, the treadmills held no interest for me. I started each day with the Planet Fitness Circuit w workout. That took about 30 minutes. I then spent 20 minutes on the C2 rowing machine, 20 minutes on the stair stepper, and finished up with 20 minutes on an upright bike. I never got a TV, but I did get a used desktop computer with a nice size monitor. My daily entertainment consisted mostly of YouTube videos. I didn't cook much, but did find that my eating habits sort of evolved a bit. Although it was not my intention, I found myself drifting toward a keto-type diet. Combining that with my odd working hours, I realized that I was also doing a bit of fasting. After three months, I was feeling better and losing weight. It was time to call my daughters again. This time, I called Alice. Hi. Alice, it's your dad. Well, it is about time. We were all concerned about you. Are you okay? Yes, I am great. Don't worry about me. I have always been able to take care of myself. I am calling just to make sure that your mother is doing okay. Mom is doing great. It seems like she got a raise at work and loves her job. She is, however, extremely pissed at you. She said that you deserted her at her promotion celebration and then left home like a hurt little boy. Those are the words that she used. She said you were jealous of her success. Well, I am sorry, but I can't add anything to that. Until she is ready to tell you the truth, that is all I have. She said that things are a bit tight without your income, but with her raise she can handle it. Well, I am happy for her. Did she tell you anything about her new job? Just that she is making more money and gets to travel a lot. I did not respond. After a slight pause, Alice started up again. Will you be coming home for Christmas? I don't think so. I'll try and send something for you and Batty. We don't need or want anything, Dad. We would rather have you here. Sorry about that. I have to go now. Tell Batty I said hello. Bye. To Sissy, I felt a little down in the dumps. I got the feeling that my daughters did not understand the situation and felt that I was the reason for all of the problems. I wasn't happy about that, but did not feel that I was obligated to explain myself. It was apparent that there was no remorse on my wife's side. I found myself getting a little bitter. From what my daughter said, Candy was doing quite well without me. I still didn't understand why she wanted me at home. I finished off my case of black and tan and spent the weekend despondent. My beer consumption had been increasing. As the weeks went by, I found things improving nicely. I was doing well at work and got a raise that I was not expecting. They gave me free reign as far as my duties were concerned, and in a very short time, I had streamlined and improved the stock replenishment system. 
I provided a weekly report that they used to set inventory levels and establish reordering intervals. The store's overall computer system was already doing this, but they seemed to appreciate the manual input. My living arrangements were ideal for my situation and well within my budget. My weight was down and I was building some muscle. In the right lighting I could see a six-pack. I stopped shaving and now had a full head of hair just long enough to make a small ponytail. My whole image seemed to have changed and I seemed a bit fearsome. My gym workouts were getting easier and a bit longer. An unexpected side effect was that I was also making a few friends at the gym. They were not really friends, but more like acquaintances. I was very careful around the female gym rats because I did not want any impropriety problems. With the guys, it didn't matter. In fact, we were poking fun at each other regularly. There was, however, one very unusual union that cropped up. Her name was Judy, or at least that was what everybody called her. She was not very friendly and seldom talked to anyone. I turned out to be the exception. She was there every morning and worked steadily for at least two hours. It was an intense workout, not a frilly yoga-type routine. I guessed that she was about mid-forties or so, hard-looking and always wore sweatpants and a sweatshirt. All the other females were showing off their bodies with tight latex and skimpy outfits, not Judy. I took a good bit of razzing because I was the only male in the whole cage that she talked to or even looked at. I didn't encourage her, but I also didn't turn her away in any fashion. To be honest, I was a bit flattered. Several months passed, and I had not contacted either my daughters or my wife. I just could not force myself to do it. I made several trips to Huntsville to add to my Krugerrand collection. Then, things started to change. Michael, could I speak with you a moment? This was not a usual conversation starter with Judy. She called me Michael when all the guys used Mike. Come to think of it, she had never really referred to me by my name before. Sure, no problem. Is there something that I can help you with? As a matter of fact, there is. We both took a bench and got comfortable. I have a company affair that I have to attend Friday evening, and I need an escort. I will take care of all the expenses, and I only need you to go with me. I notice that you don't drive, so I will also provide transportation. If it is necessary, I can reimburse you. I hesitated, and she quickly picked up on it. I'm sorry. Did I do or say something wrong? No, not at all. It is just that I have a few skeletons in the closet, so to speak. If you can work around them, I will be happy to help you out. Okay. What are the problems? First of all, I am married. Oh, crap. You never mentioned a wife. I guess that queers the whole deal. No, not at all. I just wanted to let you know up front. I have not seen or talked to my wife in over nine months. I don't even know if I am still married. Have you filed for divorce or separation? No. Next. I do not have anything appropriate to wear. No suit, jacket, dress shirts, or regular shoes. I have no use for any of that stuff, so I don't have it. No problem. I can take care of that. This is why I am asking a week ahead. I do work nights, but I think I can get the evening off with no problem. I am glad you solved that one. She smiled when she said that. What else? Do you want me to shave or anything? Michael, I like your beard and I like your hair, but to be honest, you are a bit scruffy. Would you mind if my stylist looked you over Friday afternoon? Stylist? She smiled and I groaned and nodded that it was okay. So started my relationship with Judy, professionally known as Judy Walker, attorney at law. Tuesday, I ended up at Joss A. Banks. Not really a high-class place, but a step above anything I had ever been at. Judy had arranged for my visit ahead of time. I ended up with two pairs of pants and two sport coats. They topped it off with a couple of shirts and a few ties. I exerted myself a bit by adding two turtleneck shirts to the pile. I always liked them and thought that they would look good with sport coats. Judy had prepaid everything. On the way home, I picked up a new pair of decent shoes and some underwear. I needed the new underwear because of my recent weight loss. The shoes were moccasin style, but still classy. My visit to the stylist went well on Friday. The guy that was taking care of me was easy to get along with and did a good job. He left me with a close, neatly trimmed beard and changed my ponytail into a sort of short, modified mullet. 
I don't know the actual term, but it was long in the back. He assured me that it would be a lot easier to maintain. I liked it. He didn't talk much about Judy, but did say that I was a lucky fellow. Judy showed up at the apartment at six on the dot. She did not get out of the car, but did a short beep. The Lexus looked out of place in my neighborhood. I went with the gray jacket and gray turtleneck. I thought that I looked pretty good, but I have no point of reference. I was thankful that she was driving, because I did not know my way about the city. Judy, before we go in, can you explain what exactly I am expected to do or not do tonight? The first hour or so will probably be socializing. You don't have to get involved with any of that. Most of the people here will be big-feeling snobs that you don't want to have anything to do with. Avoid them if you can. Mainly, I want you to stay close to me and keep the leches away. Try not to be obvious, but don't let any of them elbow you out. See that I have a drink in my hand at all times, ginger ale or mineral water. Be friendly and agreeable, and whatever you do, don't lose your cool. Basically, you are arm candy. Make them think that we are a couple. I never thought of myself as that kind of a guy. I don't have a lot of experience doing things like that. Are you going to be able to handle it? You bet. Oh, is there any food? After about an hour, we will each get a dollar five hundred plate of rubber chicken and listen to some speeches. When that is over, there will more glad handing. Oh, by the way, you look good. It was at that point that I realized that I had not complimented her on her dress or her hair. I really was out of my element. The first part of the evening went exactly as she had explained. I found my role to be a bit easier than I had anticipated. The room was full of unattached males, all of them with expensive suits and big watches. Judy did look good, and most of them knew that she was not married. Quite a few of them took the time to stop by and chatter up a bit. They were testing the waters, so to speak. I found myself giving them all a squinty eye stare, like Charles Bronson. Amazingly, it worked. Every time I left her side to refresh her drink, another vulture swooped in. A few of them brought her drinks, which she quietly handed off to me to dispose of. Judy glanced at me a couple of times and sort of smiled, sort of. At last, we got to sit down. Three hundred chicken dinners appeared from nowhere. It was a pathetic plate of food. I am not what you would call a fussy eater, but this was different. I kept thinking about that five hundred dollars. Judy sort of leaned over to me. Michael, do you want to blow this place? She tried to use a Bogart accent, but it didn't work. I didn't answer her. I just stood up, took her hand, and we quietly left. I don't think anyone even noticed. When we hit the parking garage, she kicked off her shoes and threw me the Lexus keys. Find us some real food, Michael. Twenty minutes later, we were at Hillbilly Willie's. We each had a full rack and a long neck. She was no stranger to the Tabasco. Both of us ignored the sight of fries. The bibs were eagerly welcomed. While we were eating, I noticed one unusual thing. Her evening gown had long sleeves. Most of the women's gowns all had short sleeves, or none at all. She was also still barefoot, and it didn't seem to bother her at all. Things quickly got back to normal. My evening with Judy was enjoyable, even though it didn't end up with any intimacy. We continued with our normal gym relationship. Three weeks later, Judy had another function that required an escort. I accepted, of course. I felt obligated to explain the situation to my boss, and he found it to be quite amusing. Under the circumstances, he told me that it would not be necessary to ask permission for time off just leave him a note. He more or less told me that I was responsible for my own time and to handle it accordingly. Judy's daily gym workout was pretty heavy. She kept her heart rate up, and she sweated quite a bit. She was always fully clothed. Most of the female gym rats wore sports bras and shorts. Judy wore sweatshirts and long pants. It didn't seem to make sense, but I was not going to bring it up. Our second night out was similar to the first, except that there was no food and there was more drinking. More drinking meant more lizards sniffing around. Every other guy who approached her brought a fresh drink. I was busy most of the evening collecting and disposing of the unwanted glasses. One of the more obnoxious guys finally got my goat. I took him aside and quietly told him that if he hit on my fiancé one more time, I was going to clean his clock. He disappeared for the rest of the evening. So did a lot of the other sleazes. 
I didn't realize that I had become so menacing. We went for sushi after the gathering, but ended up eating forty dollars worth of sashimi. It was another fun, platonic evening. Two days later, Judy surprised me while I was doing my rowing. Why didn't you tell me we were engaged? I was a bit embarrassed yesterday when some of my workmates asked me about it. She didn't wait for an answer, but she did smile. I called Batty. She said that Candy had been avoiding her and Alice. All Batty knew was that Candy was traveling a lot and that people were staying over at the house on a regular occasion. I asked her if her mother had filed for divorce, and she had no idea. It had been several weeks since she or Alice had had any contact. For some reason, I was pissed off. The more bottles I emptied, the worse it got. The next morning, I got one of the flat rate boxes at the post office and mailed 74 valve stems to Oscar Griffin at Gilbert Industries. I included a short note. Thanks for a fun evening. It had been well over a year since the party, but I was pretty sure that he would remember it. I missed the gym that day. I didn't want to work out with a hangover. I did get the third degree from Judy the next day. I promised to explain everything to her the next time we had supper together. She picked me up at six that night. Judy took me to Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. It was my first time in a place like that. I did dress up nice for her. She listened quietly and passed no judgment the entire night. I was back at my apartment in time for my work shift. Judy had one more question for me the next day at the gym. Did I know any of the people who were at the lodge that night? When I told her that I had the names and addresses of everyone that was there, her eyes lit up. After our workout, she stopped by the apartment and I gave her an envelope with 12 car registrations. She grabbed them and kissed me on the cheek. There are 15 kinds of lawyers. Judy was a personal injury lawyer. She tried to explain it to me, but I just smiled and asked her what this was going to cost me. All I got for an answer was another kiss on the cheek. Three days later, I got a call from my daughter, Alice. Candy had called her to see if she knew where I was. Some sort of a problem had cropped up at Candy's workplace, and she was in the middle of it. She was not happy and needed to talk to me immediately. Alice refused to tell her anything. I wonder if Oscar got those valve stems. I called Judy and told her that I would be picking her up in 20 minutes. Her office was in an upscale strip mall. It was nice, but not too flashy. Judy had never seen the Challenger. The subject of my car ownership never came up before. The sound of the engine preceded my arrival and resulted in several curious onlookers from her office as she walked out to the car. I came around to open the door for her and smiled at all of the gawkers. Judy was laughing when she got in the car. Well played, Michael. Well played. I guess you will want an engagement ring now. In good time. Don't rush it. I kept the Challenger under control until we crossed the Tennessee River. Then I started to let her open up a bit. Route 72 going into Huntsville is a nice stretch of road, but not the best place to show off. We were seated at Dreamland within two hours. Michael, all of the people that were at the lodge that night were served today. What do you mean served? It is a lawsuit. The actual term is malicious conduct contributing to the deterioration of a marriage. There is really such a thing? It appears that all of the required categories had been met. Their conduct was intentional, it was extreme, and it caused you severe emotional distress. That must be why my wife was upset. By that time, we each had a slab of dreamland ribs in front of us. The conversation slowed down a bit. Judy had just finished sucking her last rib when she looked up. What do you mean your wife was upset? My daughter Alice called me today and said that Candy needed to talk to me. There was a big problem at work and she was involved in it in some fashion. I don't know any more than that. Oscar Griffin and Gilbert Industries are being sued for one million dollars. The, the other eleven people are being sued for one hundred thousand each. I am not trying to be a smart ass or anything, but do you think that that will work? Of course. Maybe not as cut and dry as it looks, but I think a few interesting things might happen. I wanted another long neck, but could not risk it because of the long drive home. Judy could risk it, and enjoyed gloating as she drank the lager. I was feeling a bit frisky as we exited the restaurant, so I casually asked Judy if she would like to get a room and go back in the morning. I'd like to, but I can't. 
We can leave early if you'd like. That's not it. Let's just go now. I'll explain it to you on the way home. Everything was quiet in the car for the first 20 minutes, and then she started to open up. It seems that eight years ago, Judy weighed almost 300 pounds. She decided to diet and exercise rather than get bypass surgery. She lost 140 pounds. Unfortunately, she was plagued with 20 pounds of loose, flabby skin. It took five surgeries to remove the excess flesh, and she is now left with scars across her whole body. Judy is a brave, outspoken woman, but she admitted that she was very self-conscious about the scars. She avoided dating and any contact with male friends. For some reason, she felt comfortable with me, but didn't know why. I dropped her off at her house, walked her to the door, and gave her a small kiss on the cheek. She thanked me for the meal and had a small tear in her eye as I left. We continued our platonic dating. We both seemed content with it. Nickajack markets seemed to be popular with the local folks. In less than two years, they had added two additional stores and were looking for more. The owners were serious when they offered me a full-time position as inventory manager for all three units. They did, however, insist that I become a regular hire, which meant that I had to go fully legal. At this point, it didn't seem to matter anymore, so I accepted. Judy was happy, so I was happy. Several more weeks passed. I had not heard from my daughters for quite a while, and then I got a short text message on my phone. Mom got fired! That complicated things a bit. I now had a regular job with a decent salary, and Candy was no longer working. At this point, I was afraid that I would end up getting screwed in a divorce. Then, things got worse. Michael, I have some good news for a change. Judy was serious, and I was all ears. Three of the eleven people that we sued have settled. What does that mean? Since we had only sued for $100,000, they were advised by their insurance companies to just go ahead and pay it and avoid any public litigation. It was covered by their insurance, so it was no great personal loss to them. You mean we might get some money out of this? Michael, I already got three checks. There might be more coming. Do you think this might have something to do with Candy getting fired? I'm pretty sure that it was. Is this going to screw up my divorce? Did you file yet? No, not yet. I was going to ask you to help me with it. Judy had a really big smile on her face. Michael, pack a small bag and get the challenger ready. We are going to take a road trip to see your wife. We will leave Thursday morning early. Now I was smiling. We left at 6 a.m. and checked into the Sheraton ten hours later. The challenger was happy. I called Alice and asked her to bring Candy and Batty to lunch at the Reading Motor Inn the next day. The conversation at supper was a bit awkward. Picking and choosing off the Red Lobster menu was fun, and we ended up spending more money than we anticipated. We didn't care because it was a celebration of sorts. Our conversation was varied and convoluted. Why? We were both cautious about avoiding the elephant in the room. We were spending our first night together. We were friends without benefits for over a year. The last thing I wanted to do was make her feel uncomfortable. While I won't get into the details of the evening, I will say that it was not nearly as traumatic as we anticipated. We were both a little bit rusty, but managed to get through it with the expected results. She seemed relieved that I was not repulsed, and I was happy that it was not near as bad as she led me to believe. We were a couple of happy fools. We had a late breakfast in the morning. Candy and the girls were waiting at the table when we arrived. I wore one of my new sports coats with a dark turtleneck. I looked good. Judy wore one of her lighter business suits, sort of casual professional. My wife and my daughters looked at me in amazement. Candy, Alice, Batty, this is Judy Walker, my confidant and attorney. Judy, my wife Candy and daughters, Alice and Batty. It was awkward, but the best I could do. Before we could get to any meaningless chit-chat, the waiter showed up to take the drink orders. I am not hungry. If you don't mind, I'll just have coffee. Candy was first to break the silence. I quickly glanced around the table and came to the same conclusion. Why don't you just bring us five coffees and leave a pot on the table? The waiter nodded, and everyone seemed relieved at the decision. It is nice to see you again, Mike. Would you care to bring us up to date on what you have been doing the last few years? Candy had a slight smirk when she said it. Just working and allowing you the freedom to find yourself or whatever you were doing. 
Judy slightly kicked me under the table. I needed you, and you deserted me. You might have needed somebody, but it wasn't me. Mom, Dad, quit it. I am sure you didn't set up this meeting so that you could sit and snipe at each other. Dad, what are we here for? Alice was being very assertive. I could see that this was going to be a very short gathering. I was at a loss. I glanced over to Judy for a hint of some kind as to how to go forward. She ignored me but took over the conversation. Judy reached in her purse and pulled out an envelope. She handed it across the table to Candy. Mrs. Johnson, this is a divorce petition. I think that you will find it very fair. I suggest that you take it to your attorney and have him look it over. Batty and Alice both looked astonished. It was easy to see that they were not expecting this. Candy, however, had a big grin on her face. She didn't take the envelope from Judy, but reached under the table and got a similar one from her purse. You stupid jerk. I divorced your wimpy ass eight months ago for desertion. You never got a copy, because I didn't know where to send it. It is final. Whatever you got here is worthless. There is nothing that you have that I want anyhow. Her smile turned into a big smirk. The waiter returned with our coffee and a full urn for the table, just as Candy was getting up. She smiled at Judy and me and gave the girls a weird look before leaving. She left both envelopes on the table. Dad, can we all stay for lunch? I hear that they have a really good quiche here, Batty said. Judy and I had a small laugh and asked the waiter for menus. Judy, Batty, and Alice had a great lunch and conversation. I felt like I was eating alone. I never did understand women too well. The girls all exchanged phone numbers and promised to keep in touch. After returning to the room, I started packing. Michael, I thought that we were staying another night. We are, but not here. Hurry up and pack. One hour and thirty minutes after that, we were in Elkton, Maryland. Thirty minutes later, Judy Walker became Judy Johnson. We spent the night in Luray, Virginia. I wanted to go further, but we didn't make it. We got a house with a three-car garage. That's another story. The girls said that Candy had a fit when she found out I got two million dollars from Gilbert Industries. Candy moved to Iowa. I don't know why. 